So thank you, you Seattleites. I am thrilled to be here, and that is true because I noticed outside that water is being presented in its natural state. <laughs> I, I saw this uh, briefly this morning in New York, but you guys really have it here. So I'm a Santa Barbarian. We are in our fifth year of drought with water restrictions, 30% mandatory water restrictions. So <clears throat> it becomes rather difficult. Uh, my wife and I <clears throat> don't shower, of course. We bathe together once a month. <laughs> uh, we use that water then, of course, to wash the clothing. Then we boil the spaghetti with it and throw it out on the, on the plants. So it's, been, it's, it's a miracle to see this. Um, I have been uh, traveling around with the new book, which came out three days ago. And I would like to tell you a little bit about it. <clears throat> and then, I'm not going to read to you from it. I'm going to read you a brand new story that's going to be in The New Yorker next week. But first, I want to tell you about the Terranauts. So, um, many of you may remember the biosphere experiment of 91 through 93, in which, <clears throat> in the Arizona desert, north of, east of Tucson, a friendly billionaire put up the money uh, under the aegis of a creative type, uh, to make, to see if we could uh, make a self-generating biosphere. We're living in biosphere one, this is it. Could we have a second biosphere? So <clears throat> they built this extraordinary structure and, and closed on 3.15 acres, uh, 3,800 species of plants and insects. Uh, they had tremendous chutzpah. They, they, they tried, they put in five different uh, regions. Uh, they had a desert. They had uh, what they called an ocean, which was really an Olympic-sized swimming pool, but, but deeper. Uh, they had a, a savanna. They had a, a rainforest. Uh, it was really an extraordinary thing to try to uh, live a subsistence diet, made, make their own food, and so on. Four men and four women were selected <clears throat> out of an initial crew of 16. Uh, one of them had to be a doctor, of course, because of potential accidents. And they were sealed in for two years. This was to be the first closure of 50 consecutive closures of this artificial environment. And it was really quite extraordinary. It was a microcosm of what we have here. So that um, <clears throat> if they had a few cloudy days, uh, they would have problems with the uh, CO2, O2 levels. Uh, they had to recycle all their water. Our water is being recycled for us sometimes over a uh, process of, of, of years, you know, groundwater and so on. Theirs, it would be days. So um, my interest in it was the same as probably yours, that is, the thrill of this conceit of four men, four women being locked inside for two years. Nothing in, nothing out. That was their mantra. However, <clears throat> I began to lose interest, and I think a lot of people did, because within 12 days, uh, one of the Biospherians, a young woman, cut off the tip of her finger while uh, using the rice mulling machine, and she got her finger caught. The doctor in, inside, who was part of the crew, uh, sewed it back on. But, you know, it wasn't doing so very well or looking so great. And she held it up to the glass of the, at the visitor's window, and the best hand man in Pima County came and looked at it. He said, you've got to come out of there. 12 days. So she did. She broke closure within 12 days of this thing. <clears throat> and um, she was only out in our atmosphere for five hours. They calculated how many lungs full of our air she, she breathed. But nonetheless, she was there. And by the way, she went, when she went back in, she had two bags with her. What was in those bags? Nobody knows. But had, had they really been in a Mars colony, well, they would have been dead, you know? So I think the general public began to lose interest because this was fascinating. They are locked inside. All right, so now I step into the picture. Uh, all these years later, I decided that I would like to return to this um, and wonder from an ecological perspective if this would work. So there were supposed to be 52-year closures. So I am positing a second closure. Uh, and, and, and by the way, the, in the original biosphere, the friendly billionaire, and you know, billionaires can be erratic. I think you, you probably appreciate that. <laughs> so he, he bowed out six months into the second closure. He had a big fight with the creator. 
and that was the end of it. Uh, the structure is still there. It's beautiful. It's a, it's a, a, a tourist attraction. Uh, if you're ever in the Tucson area, it's well worth looking at. But it's not closed anymore. Uh, and that was the thrill. So I step into this picture, and I, I felt, well, what if there were a second closure? And so I created the Terranauts. Instead of Biospherians, I'm calling them Terranauts. Instead of the Biosphere 2, I'm calling it the Ecosphere 2. Why? Well, I don't want to step on their toes, uh, but also I want to remind you that this is fiction. In my telling, I've done something I've never done before. I have three eye narrators. The first is Dawn Chapman, and she is one of the 16, and she is one of the final eight and selected to be one of the Terranauts. The second is a man, Ramsey Ruthorpe. His job is the communications officer of this crew. That is, he will communicate with the outside world. Uh, this was a huge, in real life, this was a huge tourist attraction in its time. Uh, they were aping NASA. They even wore jumpsuits like, like NASA. They were splashed over the covers of every magazine and uh, on TV. It was a fascinating thing in its time. At any rate, <clears throat> um, and by the way, <laughs> everything they did was being observed, not only by this kind of big brother of mission control, but also by tourists and fans of this thing who were looking in all the time, and by the way, trying to tempt them. Uh, it really happened that somebody put a pepperoni pizza in the box outside the airlock just to see if they would open it, which they didn't, by the way. Uh, and the third character is Linda Ryu. She's one of the 16 who is not chosen, but she is kept on as support staff with the promise that she will be in the third mission. Um, and each talks in the first person. What this did for me was it enabled me to make it very intimate. You are hearing them talk directly to you, and each is telling essentially the same story, but they have their prejudices, and they're having their infighting, and so on. Um, as you may know, I work intuitively. I will do research, and uh, at some point, a voice begins to talk to me, and I follow it. I'm not trying to be mystical. It's not mystical in any way, except that where the story comes from is sort of mystical. Um, I do like to have some idea of structure, though, before I begin a project. And here was the structure. It was ready-made for me. There are four parts. The first is pre-closure. So I'm talking all these three uh, are fighting to see if they will get in. Then there is year one of closure, year two of closure, and then re-entry. And um, it seemed to structure the book for me. It gave me a bare bones to hang all of this story on. Uh, I also like to have epigraphs to begin because they serve as a kind of proposition. Um, is it true? So there are two epigraphs to this book, <clears throat> and they, as you'll see, they oppose one another. The first is from Margaret Mead, and it is this. Never doubt that a small group of committed, thoughtful people can change the world. In fact, it is the only thing that ever has. And I'm opposing this with <clears throat> a comment from Jean-Paul Sartre's play, No Exit. L'enfer, c'est les autres. Hell is other people. Now, <laughs> these are the two propositions that I'm going into this novel with, and I'm opposing all of these three cult members, because really this is a kind of cult. And many of you will remember my book from 2003 called Drop City. This is about the Back to the Earth movement of the 1960s, that is, the hippies <clears throat> who felt we should, with withdraw from this crazy wheel that we're all on of capitalism and more and more product and the destruction of the world, et cetera. Um, I wondered, well, what about that? Was that a viable proposition? So I wrote Drop City to find out. And it involved a commune in 1969 of people in California who decide to go to the final frontier of Alaska. And I wrote it to find out what would happen. Is this viable? Could we go back to the Earth? Well, of course we can't. There's seven billion of us. We're chewing up everything uh, in the world. And, and we've got uh, global warming, and everything is turning to, well, I talked some Frank, Merd. It's all turning to Merd. <clears throat> so this one kind of circles back to that, and it's the same idea. It's a cult. It's a commune. Uh, they're totally dedicated to this project. Uh, but now it's in a microcosm, and instead of going out into the world, they are creating a new world. <clears throat> I'll leave you, because I am going to read you the new story, I'll leave you with this. Uh, what fascinates me here is, what if there were 
10 friendly billionaires, and they built 10 biospheres, uh, even within sight of one another. <clears throat> each one, and they, and they did go a full 100 years, each one would have been a completely new world that it evolved in its own way, uh, independent of the others. It would have been quite fascinating. And I'm sorry that <clears throat> it didn't work out because imagine now we'd be deep into uh, you know, the, the 20th closure of this thing. It's actually, it's the 25th anniversary, so that would be 12 and a half closures, uh, just to see how the plants and animals survived in there. And by the way, when I went to visit, <clears throat> and you can visit, as I said earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, um, losing my voice because I've been on the airplane with people sneezing on me. Um, they take you on a little tour, and the rainforest section now, it's 25 years old. Uh, the first thing I saw was a squash cockroach. Uh, in the original biosphere, and I'm using all of those details in this book, uh, they brought in three different species of cockroaches purposely as the tritophores. They're part of this suite of 3,800 plants and animals. Um, but wonderfully, in the time it took to build the, the ecosphere, biosphere too, while it was open, the cockroach that lives in our bathroom snuck in there and completely dominated and took over all the other cockroaches and everything else in the place. And so now, all this time later when I went, that's what we saw in there, the cockroaches. They're doing very well. <laughs> so, <clears throat> because it's a special night, and this story isn't coming out till the November 7 issue, so it'll be Halloween, it'll be available. I'd like to show you what I've been doing lately. I've just delivered the next book to my publisher. And by the way, I don't know if any of my publisher's representatives are listening, but I am the publisher's dream. Not only do I tell them what I'm gonna do and turn it in on time, I go out on tour and, and enchant everybody too. Come on, you know? Anyway, I've turned in the next book and it's a new collection of stories called The Relive Box. And now I'm uh, doing research for the next novel and taking notes on it. And I really can't tell you what it is yet because I don't want to give it away, but it's about a chemical substance that appeared quite in, a, in quite a big way in the society <clears throat> in the late 50s and the 1960s. And you've probably never heard of it, but its initials are LSD. <clears throat> so that's next. I hope. At any rate, um, my latest obsession is uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, genetic engineering. I don't know if you're aware of this, but in the last couple of years, we've discovered a way to accelerate the way we can um, make transgenic species of all kinds. Uh, even, I, I subscribe to Nature and Science and New England Journal of Medicine, and you will see in these magazines <clears throat> over the last couple of years a full-page ad, and it shows a boxer's glove smashing against something, and it says, uh, knock out any gene. You can buy your own home kit to tinker with <clears throat> bacteria and, and yeast and make your own new uh, combinations of these things. These are transgenic combinations. Now. Is this a good idea? <laughs> Let's find out. I'm projecting <clears throat> a couple of years into the future, and I'm also going to create some new creatures for you tonight. But keep in mind, when we have a list of these creatures, two-thirds of them actually exist already. So the story <clears throat> is called, Are We Not Men? The dog was the color of a maraschino cherry, and what it had in its jaws, I couldn't quite make out at first, not until it parked itself under the hydrangeas and began throttling the thing. This little episode would have played itself out without my even noticing, except that I'd gone to the stove to put the kettle on for a cup of tea and happened to glance out the window at the front lawn. The lawn, a deep, lush blue-green that managed to hint at both the turquoise of the sea and the viridian of a Kentucky meadow, was something I took special pride in, and any wandering dog, no matter its chromatics, was an irritation to me. The seed had been pricey, a blend of chewings, fescue, baia, and zoysia, incorporating a gene from a species of algae that allowed it to glow under the porch light at night. And while it was both disease and drought resistant, it didn't take well to foot traffic, especially four-footed traffic. I stepped out on the porch and clapped my hands, thinking to shoo the dog away, but it didn't move. Actually, it did, but only to flex its shoulders and tighten its jaws around its pay, prey, 
which I now saw was my neighbor Allison's pet micro pig. The pig itself, doe-eyed and no bigger than a Pekingese, didn't seem to be struggling, or not any longer. And even as I came down off the porch looking to grab the first thing I could find to brandish at the dog, I felt my heart thundering. Allison was one of those pet owners who tend to anthropomorphize their animals, and that pig was the center of her unmarried and unboyfriended life. She would be shattered, absolutely, and who was going to break the news to her? I felt a surge of anger. How had this stupid thing got out of the house anyway? And for that matter, whose dog was this? I didn't own a garden rake, and there were no sticks on the lawn. The street trees were an edited variety that didn't drop anything, not twigs, seeds, or leaves, no matter the season. So I stormed across the grass, empty-handed, shouting the first thing that came to mind, which was, bad, bad dog. I wasn't thinking. And the effect wasn't what I would have hoped for, even if I had been. The dog dropped the pig all right, which was clearly beyond revivification at this point. But in the same motion, it lurched up and clamped its jaws on my left forearm, growling continuously as if my forearm were a stick it had fetched in a friendly game between us. Curiously, there was no pain or no blood either, just a firm, insistent pressure. The saliva hopped and wet on my skin as I pulled in one direction, and the dog, all the while regarding me out of a pair of dull, uniform eyes, pulled in the other. Let go, I demanded. But the dog didn't let go. Bad dog, I repeated. I tugged. The dog tugged back. There was no one on the street, no one in the next yard over, no one in the house behind me to come to my aid. I was dressed in the t-shirt, shorts, and slippers I'd pulled on not 10 minutes earlier when I got out of bed. And here I was, caught up in this maddening interspecies pas de deux at 8 in the morning of an otherwise ordinary day, already exhausted. The dog, this cherry red hairless freak with the armored skull and bulging musculature of a pit bull, showed no sign of giving in. It had got my arm and it meant to keep it. After a minute of this, I went down on one knee to ease the tension in my back, a gesture that only seemed to excite the animal all the more, its nails tearing up divots as it fought for purchase, trying, it occurred to me now, to bring it down to its level. Before I knew what I was doing, I balled up my free hand and punched the thing in the head three times in quick succession. The effect was instantaneous. The dog dropped my arm and let out a yelp, backing off to hover at the edge of the lawn and eye me warily as if now, all at once, the rules of the game had changed. In the next moment, just as I realized I was, in fact, bleeding, a voice cried out behind me, Hey, I saw that! A girl was striding across the lawn toward me, a preternaturally tall girl I at first took to be a teenager but was actually a child of 11 or 12. As soon as she appeared, the dog fell in step with her and everything became clear. You hit my dog! I was in no mood. I'm bleeding, I said, holding up my arm in evidence. You see this? Your dog bit me. You ought to keep him chained up. That's not true. Ruby would never bite anybody. She was just playing is all. I wasn't about to debate her. This was my property, my arm, and that lump of flesh lying there bleeding into the grass was Allison's dead pet. I pointed to it. Oh, she said, her voice dropping. I'm so sorry, I didn't. Is it yours? My neighbor's. I gestured to the house just over the hedge. She's going to be devastated. This pig, I wanted to call it by name, personalize it, but couldn't for the life of me summon its name, is all she has. And it wasn't cheap either. I glanced at the dog, its pinkish gaze and incarnadine flanks, as I'm sure you can appreciate. The girl, who stood three or four inches taller than me, and whose own eyes were an almost iridescent, sh iridescent shade of violet that didn't exist in nature, or at least hadn't until recently, gave me an unflinching look. Maybe she doesn't have to know. What do you mean she doesn't have to know? The thing's dead, look at it. Maybe it was run over by a car. You want me to lie to her? The girl shrugged. The dog, panting, settled down on its haunches. I already said I'm sorry. Ruby got out the front gate when my mother went to work, and I came right after her. You saw me. What about this? I demanded, holding up my arm, which wasn't so much punctured as abraded, since most of the new breeds had had their canines and carnassials genetically modified to prevent any real damage in a situation like this. It has its shots, right? She's a cherry pit, the girl said, giving me a look of disgust. Germline immunity comes with the package. I mean, everybody knows that. 
It was a Tuesday, and I was working from home, as I did every Tuesday and Thursday. I worked in IT like practically everybody else on the planet, and I found I actually got more work done at home than when I went into the office. <clears throat> My coworkers were a trial, what with their moods, opinions, facial tics, and all the rest. Not that I didn't like them, it was just that they always seemed to manage to get in the way at crunch time. Or maybe I didn't like them, maybe that was it. At any rate, after the little contretemps with the girl and her dog, I went back in the house, smeared an antibiotic ointment on my forearm, took my tea and a handful of protein wafers to my desk, and sat down at the computer. If I gave the dead pig a thought, it was only in relation to Allison, who'd want to see the corpse, I surmised, which brought up the question of what to do with it. Let it lie where it was, or stuff it in a trash bag and refrigerate it till she got home from the office. I thought of calling my wife. Connie was regional manager of Bank USA, by necessity, a master of interpersonal relations, and she would know what to do. But then it was hardly worth bothering at her at work over something so trivial. I could have buried the corpse, I suppose, or tossed it in the trash and played dumb, but in the end, I wound up doing nothing. It was past three by the time I thought to take a lunch break, and because it was such a fine day, I brought my sandwich and a glass of iced tea out onto the front porch. By this juncture, I'd forgotten all about the pig, the dog, and the grief that was brewing for Allison. But as soon as I stepped out the door, it all came back to me. The trees were alive with crow parrots, variously screeching, cawing, and chattering amongst themselves. And they were there for a very specific reason. I don't know if you have crow parrots in your neighborhood yet, but believe me, they're coming. They were the inspiration of one of the molecular embryologists at the university here who felt that inserting genes of the common crow into the invasive parrot population would put an end to the parrot's raids on our orchards and vineyards, giving them a taste for garbage and carrion instead of fruit on the vine and having the added benefit of displacing the native crows, which had pretty well eliminated songbirds from our backyards. The only problem was the noise factor. Something in the mix seemed to have redoubled not only the volume, but the fury of the bird's calls, so that half the time you needed earplugs if you wanted to enjoy pretty much any outdoor activity, which was the case now. The birds were everywhere, cursing fluidly, bad bird, fuck, 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 and flapping their spangled wings in one another's faces. Alarmed, I came down off the porch and for the second time that day, scrambled across the lawn to the flower bed where a scrum of birds had settled on the remains of Allison's pet. I flailed my arms, and they lifted off reluctantly into the sky, screeching, turd bird, and the fractured call that awakened me practically every morning, cock sucker. <laughs> As for the pig, which I should have dragged into the garage, I realize that now, its eyes were gone, and its faintly bluish hide was striped with bright red gashes. Truthfully, I didn't want to touch the thing. It was filthy. The birds were filthy. Who knew what zoonoses they were carrying? So I was just standing there in a quandary when Allison's car pulled into the driveway next door, scattering light. Allison was in her early 30s with a top-heavy figure and a barely tamed kink of ginger hair she kept wrapped up in various scarves, which gave her an exotic look as if she were displaced here in the suburbs. She was sad-faced and sweet, the victim of one catastrophic relationship after another, and I couldn't help feeling protective toward her a single woman alone in that big house her mother had left her when she died. So when she came across the lawn already tearing up, I felt I'd somehow let her down. And before I could think, I'd stripped off my shirt and draped it over the corpse. Is that her? She asked, looking down at the hastily covered bundle at my feet. No, she said, don't tell me. And then her eyes jumped to mine and she was repeating my name. Roy, 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 as if ringing it in her throat. Fuck you, the crow parrots cried from the trees. Fuck, fuck, fuck. In the next moment, she flung herself into my arms, clutching me to her so desperately I could hardly breathe. I, I don't want to see, she said in a small voice, each syllable a hot puff, puff of breath on the bare skin of my chest. I could smell her hair, the shampoo she used, the taint of sweat under her arms. The poor thing, she murmured and lifted her face so I could see the tears blurring her eyes. I loved her, Roy. I really loved her. This called up a scene from the past, a dinner party at Allison's. Connie and me, another couple, and Allison and her last inner Marata, a big-headed boar who worked for animal control, incinerating strays and transgenic misfits. Allison had kept the pig in her lap throughout the meal, feeding it from her plate. 
And afterward, while we sat around the living room cradling brandies and Benedictine, she propped the thing up at the piano where it picked out Twinkle Twinkle Little Star with its modified hooves. No, I said, agreeing with her, you don't want to look. It, it was a dog, right? That's what, and here she had to break off a moment to gather herself. That's what Terry Wolfson said when she called me at work. I was going to offer up some platitude about how the animal hadn't suffered, though for all I knew, the, gum, the dog had gummed it relentlessly the way it had gummed my arm, when a voice called, hello, from the street behind us, and we broke hastily apart. Coming up the walk was the tall girl, tottering on a pair of platform heels, and she had the dog with her, this time on a leash. I felt a stab of annoyance. Hadn't she caused enough trouble already? An embarrassment, that too. It wasn't like me to go shirtless in public, or to be caught in a full body embrace with my unmarried next door neighbor either, for that matter. If she could read my face, the girl gave no indication of it. She came right up to us, the dog trotting along docilely at her side. Her violet gaze swept from me to the lump on the ground beneath the bloodied t-shirt and finally to Allison. Je suis désolé, madame, she said. Pardonnez-moi, mon chien ne savait pas ce qu'il faisait. Il est un bon chien, vraiment. This girl, this child, loomed over us, her features animated. She was wearing eyeliner, lipstick, and blush as if she were 10 years older and on her way to a nightclub. And her hair, blonde with a natural curl, spread like a tent over her shoulders and dangled all the way down to the small of her back. What are you saying, I demanded, and why are you speaking French? Because I can. Puedo hablar en español también, und ich kann auch in Deutsch sprechen. My IQ is 162, and I can run the 100 meters in 9.58 seconds. <laughs> Wonderful, I said, exchanging a look with Allison. Terrific, really. But what are you doing here? What do you want? Your mother, the birds cried. Up yours! <laughs> the girl shifted from one foot to the other, looking awkward like the child she was. I just wanted to please, please beg you not to report Ruby to animal control, because my father says they'll come and put her down. She's a good dog, she really is. And she never did anything like this before, and we never, never, ever let her run loose. It was just a freak occurrence, I said. Right, she said, an anomaly, an accident. Allison's jaw tightened. The dog looked tranquilly up at us out of its pink eyes as if all this were none of its concern. A bugless breeze rustled the trees along the street. And what am I supposed to say, Allison put in? How am I supposed to feel? What do you want, forgiveness? Well, I'm sorry, but I just can't do it. Not now. She gave the girl a fierce look. You love your dog? The girl nodded. Well, I love, love Shoshana too. She choked up more than anything in the world. We all took a minute to gaze down on the carcass. Then the girl lifted her eyes. My father says we'll pay all damages. Here, she said, digging into her purse and producing a pair of business cards, one of which she handed to me and the other to Allison. Any medical treatment you may need, we'll take care of it 100%, she assured me, eyeing my arm doubtfully, before turning to Allison. And replace your pet, too, if you want, madame. It was a micropig, right, from Recomba Corp? It was a painful moment. I could feel for Allison and the girl, too, though Connie and I didn't have any pets, not even one of the new hypoallergenic breeds. And we didn't have children, either, though we'd discussed it often enough. There was a larger sadness at play here. The sadness of attachment and loss and the way the world wreaks its changes whether we're ready for them or not. We would have gotten through the moment, I think, coming to some sort of understanding. Allison wasn't vindictive and I wasn't about to raise a fuss. But that same breeze swept across the lawn to flip back the edge of the t-shirt and expose the eyeless head of the pig and that was all it took. Allison let out a gasp and the dog, that crimson freak, jerked the leash out of the girl's hand and went right for it. When Connie came home, I was in the kitchen mixing a drink. The front door slammed. Connie was always in a hurry, no wasted motion. And though I'd asked her a hundred times not to slam the door, she was constitutionally incapable of taking the extra two seconds to ease it shut. An instant later, her briefcase slapped down on the hallway table with the force of a thunderclap. Her heels drilled the parquet floor, tat, 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 tat. And then she was there in the kitchen saying, make me one too, would you, honey? Or no, wine, do we have any wine? I didn't ask her how her day had gone. All her days were the same, pedal to the metal, one situation after another, all of which she dealt with like a five-tar general driving the enemy into the sea. 
I didn't give her a hug or blow her a kiss either. We weren't that sort of couple. To her mind, and mine too, to be honest, it would just have been more wasted motion. Wordlessly, I turned to the cabinet, took a glass down from the cupboard, poured her a glass of the Sancerre she liked, and handed it to her. Though I had the window open to catch the breeze, there was no sound of the birds, which must have flown off to haunt somebody else's yard. Allison's pet pig was killed today, I said, right out on our front lawn, by one of those transgenic pit bulls, one of the crimson ones they're always advertising on TV. Her eyebrows lifted. She swirled the wine in her glass, took a sip. And I got bit, I added, holding up my arm where a deep purplish bruise had wrapped itself around the skin just below the elbow. What she said next didn't follow. But then we often talked in non sequitur, she conducting a certain kind of call and response conversation in her head and I in mine. The response is never quite matching up. She didn't comment on my injury, or the dog, or Allison, or the turmoil I'd gone through. She just set her glass down on the counter, patted her lips where the wine had moistened them, and said, I want a baby. I suppose I should back up here a moment to give you an idea of where this was coming from. We'd been married 12 years now, and we'd agreed that at some point we'd like to start a family, but we kept putting it off for one reason or another. Our careers, finances, fear of the way a child would impact our lifestyle, the usual sort of thing, but with a twist. What sort of child? That was the thing. Previous generations had only to fret over whether the expectant mother would bear a boy or girl or if the child would inherit Aunt Bethany's nose or Uncle Yuri's unibrow, but that wasn't the case anymore. Not since CRISPR gene editing technology hit the ground running 20 years back. Now, not only could you choose the sex of the child at conception, you could choose its other features too. As if having a child were like going to the car dealership and picking the options to add onto the basic model. The sole function of sex these days had become recreational. Babies were conceived in a laboratory. That was the way it was and that was the way it would be until as a species we evolved into something else. The result was a nation, a world of children like the tall girl with the bright red dog. To my way of thinking, this was intrusive and unnatural, but to Connie's it was a no-brainer. Are you out of your mind, she'd say? You really want your kid, our kid, to be the bonehead of the class? Or what, take career training, cosmetology, auto mechanics, for Christ's sake? Now, tipping back her glass and downing the wine in a single belligerent gulp, she announced, I'm 38 years old and I'm putting my foot down. I've made an appointment at Gen Lab for 10 a.m. Thursday and I'm sacrificing a day of work for it too. Either you come with me. She was glaring at me now. Or I swear I'm going to go out and get a sperm donor. Nobody likes an ultimatum. Especially when you're talking about a major life-changing event, the kind of thing both people involved have to enter into in absolute harmony. It didn't go well. She thought she could bully me as if I were one of her underlings at work. I thought she couldn't. She thought she'd had the final word on the subject. I thought different. I said some things I wound up regretting later, snatched up my drink, and slammed through the kitchen door and out into the backyard where, for once, no birds were cursing from the trees, and even the bees seemed muted as they went about their business. What came next was dependent on that silence, because otherwise, I never would have heard the soft, heart-sick keening of Allison working through the stages of her grief. The sound was low and intermittent, a stunted release of air followed by a sodden gargling that might have been the wheeze and rattle of the sprinklers starting up. And it took me a minute to realize what it was and that it was coming from the adjoining yard. In the instant, I forgot all about what had just transpired in my own kitchen and thought of Allison, struck all over again by the intensity of her emotion. We'd managed to get the dog off the carcass, all three of us shouting at once while the girl grabbed for the leash and I delivered two or three sharp kicks to the animal's hindquarters. But Allison's dead pig was none the better for it. The girl, red-faced and embarrassed, despite her IQ and whatever other attributes she might have possessed, slouched across the lawn and down the street, the dog mincing beside her, and we both watched till she was gone, at which point I offered to do the only sensible thing and bury what was left of the remains. I dug a hole out back of Allison's potting shed. Allison read a passage I vaguely remembered from school. The stars are not wanted now. Put out every one. Pack up the moon and dismantle the sun. I held her in my arms for the second time that day, then filled the hole and went home to make my drink and have Connie slam the front door and lay her demands on me. Now, as if I were being tugged on invisible wires, I moved toward the low hedge that separated our properties and stepped across it. 
The first thing I saw was Allison hunched over the picnic table on her patio. She was still dressed in the taupe blouse and black skirt she'd worn to work, and she had her head down, her scarf bunched under one cheek. When I got closer, I saw that she was crying, and that got to me in a way I can't explain. So that before I knew what I was doing, I'd fallen down a long, dark tunnel and found myself consoling her in a way that seemed, how can I put this, so very natural at the time. It was dark when I got home. Connie was sitting on the couch in the living room watching TV with the sound muted. Hi, I said, feeling sheepish, feeling guilty. I'd never strayed before and didn't know why I'd done it now, except that I'd been so furious with my wife and so strangely moved by Allison and her grief, if that's an excuse, and I know it isn't, but trying, like all amateurs, to act as if nothing was out of the ordinary. Connie looked up. I couldn't read her face, but I thought, at least by the flickering light of the TV, that she looked softer, contrite even, as if she'd reconsidered her position, or at least the way she'd laid it on me. I'm sorry, I said, but I was upset, okay? I just went for a walk to clear my head. She had nothing to say to this. You eat yet? I said, to change the subject. She shook her head. Me either, I said, feeling the weight lift as if ritual could get us through this. You want to go out? No, I don't want to go out, she said. I want a baby. And what did I say? From the shallow grave of my guilt that was no deeper than the layer of earth I'd flung over the shrunken and lacerated corpse of Allison's pet, I said, okay, we'll, we'll talk about it. Talk about it? The appointment is Thursday, 10 a.m. That's non-negotiable. She was right. It was time to start a family. And she was right, too, about cosmetology and auto mechanics. What responsible parent wouldn't want the best for his child, whether that meant a stable home, top-flight nutrition, and the best private school education money could buy, or tweaking the chromosomes in a test tube in a lab somewhere? Understand me, I was under duress. I could smell Allison on me still. I could smell my own fear. I didn't want to lose my wife. I loved her. I was used to her. She was the only woman I'd known these past 12 years and more, a known quantity, a familiar. And there she was, poised on the edge of the couch, watching me, her will like some miasma seeping in under the door and through the cracks around the windows until the room was choked with it. It was like the moment in a wrestling match when the whistle blows and the grip gives way and nobody gets pinned to the mat. Okay, I said. Which is not to say I gave in without a fight. The next day, Wednesday, I had to go into the office and endure the usual banalities of my coworkers till I wanted to beat the walls of my cubicle in frustration. But on the way home, I stopped in at the pet store and picked up an eight-week-old dog cat. By the way, people still aren't quite sure what to call the young even now, 15 years after they were first created. They're not kittens and they're not puppies, but something in between, as the name of the new species implies. Kit pups, pup kits. The sign in the window read simply, baby dog cats on special. And so I picked out a squirming little fur ball with a doggish face and tabby stripes and brought it home as a surprise for Connie, hoping it would distract her long enough to reevaluate the decision she was committing us to. I tucked the thing inside my shirt for the drive home, since from the minute the girl behind the counter had put it in its cardboard ca carrying container, it had begun alternately mewing and yipping in a tragic way. And it nestled there against my chest, warm and content, until I'd parked the car and gone up the steps and into the house. Connie was already home, moving briskly about the kitchen. There were flowers on the table next to an ice bucket with the neck of a bottle of Veuve Clicquot protruding from it, and the room was redolent with the scent of my favorite meal, piperade Basque style, topped with poached eggs, which I realized she must have made a special stop for at Maison Claude on the way home. This was a celebration, and no two ways about it. In the morning, we would procreate or take our first steps in that direction, which on my part would involve producing a sperm sample under duress, unlike I couldn't help thinking the way it had been with Allison. We didn't hug. We didn't kiss. I just said, hey, and she said, hey, back. Smells great, I said, trying to gauge her expression as we both hovered over the table. Perfect timing, she said, leaning in to adjust the napkin beside her plate that was already perfectly aligned. I got there the minute they took it out of the oven. Claude himself brought it out to me, along with a fresh loaf of that crusty sourdough you like, just baked this morning. I was grinning at her. Great, I said, really great. Into the silence that followed, neither of us was ready yet to address the issue hanging over us. I said, I got a surprise for you. How sweet, what is it? 
With a magician's flourish, I whipped the new pet from the folds of my shirt and held it out triumphantly for her. Unfortunately, I seemed to have startled the thing in the process, and it reacted by digging its claws into my wrist, letting out a string of rapid-fire barks and dropping a glistening turd on the tiles of the kitchen floor. For you, I said. Her face fell. You've got to be kidding me. You really think I'm that easy to buy off or what, distract? She made no effort to take the thing from me. In fact, she clenched her hands behind her. Take it back where you got it. The pup kit had softened now, retracting its claws and settling into the crook of my arm as if it recognized me, as if in the process of selecting it and secreting it in my shirt, I'd imparted something essential to it, love that is, and it was content to exist in a new world on a new basis altogether. It's purring, I said. What do you want me to say, hallelujah? The thing's a freak. You're always saying so yourself every time one of those stupid commercials comes on. Suddenly, the jingle was playing in my head, a snatch of the last lulling measures of Pockle Bell's cannon over which the announcer croons, dog person, cat person, it's all moot now. <laughs> no more a freak than that girl with the dog, I said. What girl? What are you talking about? The one with the dog that bit me? She must have been 6'4". She had an IQ of 162, and still she let the dog out, and still it bit me. What are you saying? You're not trying to back out on me, are you? We had a deal, Roy, and you know how I feel about people that renege on a deal. Okay, 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 calm down. All I'm saying is maybe we ought to have a kind of trial or something before we... I mean, we have never even had a pet. A pet is not a child, Roy. No, I said that's not what I meant. It's just... It's just... The crow parrots started up then with one of their raucous dinner time chants, squawking so piercingly you could hear them even with the windows shut. Big Mac! Big Mac! They crowed. Fries! And I lost my train of thought. Are we going to eat? Connie said in a fragile voice. And we both looked first to the microwave and then to the animal excreta on the floor. Because I went out of my way, she said, tearing up. Because I wanted this night to be special, okay? So now we did hug though the pup kit got between us. And, coward that I am, I told her everything was going to be all right. Later, after she'd gone to bed, I took the pup kit in my arms, went next door, and rang the bell. Allison answered in her nightgown, a smile creeping across her lips. Here, I said, handing her the animal. I got this for you. Fast forward seven and a half months. I am living in a house with a pregnant woman next door to a house in which there is another pregnant woman. Connie seems to find this amusing, never suspecting the truth of the matter. We'll glance up from the porch and see Allison emerging heavily from her car with an armload of groceries, and Connie will say things like, I don't envy her, and I hope she doesn't have to pee every five minutes the way I do, and she won't say who the father is, I just hope it's not that a-hole from animal control. What was his name? This is problematic on a number of levels. I play dumb, of course. What else can I do? Maybe she went to Gen Lab, I say. Her? You're kidding me, right? I mean, look at that string of jerks she keeps dating. If you want to know the truth, she's lower class, Roy, and I'm sorry to have to say it. I'm not about to argue the point. The fact is, I tried everything I could do to talk Allison out of going through with this. Finally, to my shame, falling back on the same argument about the whole ubermensch, untermensch dynamic Connie used on me, trade school, cosmetology, self-denigration, back of the classroom, the works. But Allison merely gave me a bitter smile and said, I trust your genes, Roy. You don't have to be involved. I just want to do this, that's all, for myself and for nature. You believe in nature, don't you? You don't have to be involved. But I was involved, though we'd had sex only the one time, or two actually, counting the night I brought her the pup kit. And if she had a boy and he looked like me and grew up right next door playing with our daughter, how involved would that be? So there comes a day, sometime during that eighth month, a Tuesday when I'm working at home and Connie's at the office, and I'm so focused on the problem at hand I keep putting off my bathroom break until the morning's nearly gone. It's the way it always is when I'm deeply engaged with a problem, a kind of mind-body separation. But finally, the body's needs prevail, and I push myself up from the desk to go down the hall to the bathroom. I'm standing there in mid-flow when I became aware of the sound of a dog barking on the front lawn. And I shift my torso ever so slightly so that I can glance out the window and see what the ruckus is all about. It's the red dog, the cherry pit that set all this in motion, and he's tearing around on my hybrid lawn, chasing something. 
My first reaction is anger. Anger at the tall girl and her fixer father and all the other idiots in the world. But by the time I get down the stairs and out the front door and into the sunlight, it dissipates because I can see that the dog isn't there to kill anything but to play and that what it's chasing is being chased willingly. Allison's dog cat, now a rangy adolescent of perhaps a third the size of the dog. For all my fretting over the lawn, I have to say that in the moment, with the light making a cathedral of the street trees and the neighborhood suspended in the grip of a lazy, warm autumn afternoon, I find something wonderfully liberating in the play of those two animals, the dog cat especially. Allison named him Tiger in respect to his coloration, dark feral stripes against a kind of Pomeranian orange. And he lives up to his name, absolutely fearless and with an athleticism and elasticity that combines the best of both the species that went into making him. He runs rings around the pit bull, actually, fainting one way, dodging the next, racing up the trunk of a tree and out onto a branch before leaping to the next tree and springing back down to charge dog-like across the lawn. Go, Tiger, I call out. Good boy, go get him. That's when I become aware of Allison in a pair of maternity shorts and an enormous top, crossing from her front lawn to ours. She's put on a lot of weight, but not as much as Connie because we opted for a big baby in the 11-pound range, wanting it, her, to have that advantage right from the start. I haven't spoken with Allison much these past months, but I still have feelings for her, of course, beyond resentment, that is. So I lift a hand and wave, and she waves back, and I watch her come barefooted through the glowing grass while the sun sits in the trees and the animals frolic around her. I'm down off the porch now, and I can't help but smile at the sight of her. She comes up to me, moving with a kind of clumsy grace, if that makes any sense. And I want to take her in my arms, but can't really do that, not under these conditions. So I take both her hands and pull her to me to peck a neighborly kiss at her cheek. For a minute, neither of us says anything. Then, shading her eyes with the flat of one hand to better see the animals at play, she says, pretty cute, huh? I nod. You see how Tiger's grown? Yes, of course, I, I've been watching him all along. Is, is that as big as he's going to get? The sun catches her eyes, which are a shade of plain everyday brown. Nobody's sure, but the vet thinks he won't get much bigger, maybe a pound or two. And you, I venture, how are you feeling? Never better. You're going to be seeing more of me. Don't look scared. That's not what I mean. Just I'm taking my maternity leave, though I'm not due for like six weeks. Both her hands, pretty hands, shapely, come to rest on the bulge beneath her oversized blouse. They're really being nice about it at work. Connie's not planning to take off till the minute her water breaks because that's the way Connie is. And I want to tell her that by way of contrast, just to say something. But I notice that she's looking over my shoulder and I turn my head to see the tall girl coming up the walk, leash in hand. Sorry, the girl calls out. She got loose again. Sorry, sorry. I don't know what it is, but I'm feeling generous, expansive. No problem, I call out. She's just having a little fun. That's when Connie's car slashes into the driveway, going too fast, and all I can think is she's going to hit one of the animals. But she breaks at the last minute, and they flow like water around the tires to chase back across the lawn again. It's hard to gauge the look on my wife's face as she swings open the car door, pushes herself laboriously from behind the wheel, and sets first one foot, then the other on the pavement. I really should go help her, but it's as if I'm frozen in place. Then starts up the walk as if she hasn't seen us. Just as he reaches the front steps, Connie swivels round. I can see she's considering whether it's worth the effort to come greet our neighbor and get a closer look at the tall girl who hovers behind us like the avatar she is, but she decides against it. She stops just a moment, staring, and though she's 30 feet away, I can see a kind of recognition settle into her features, and it has to do with the way Allison is standing there beside me as if for a portrait or an illustration in a book on family planning, male and female, the XY chromosome and the XX. It's just a moment, and I can't say for certain, but her face goes rigid and she turns her back on us, mounts the steps, and slams the door behind her. When the CRISPR technology first came to light, governments and scientists everywhere assured the public that it would be employed only selectively to fight disease and rectify congenital deformities, editing out the mutated BRCA1 gene that predisposes women to breast cancer, for instance, or eliminating the ability of the Anopheles mosquito to carry the parasite that transmits malaria. Who could argue with that? Genome editing kits, knock out any gene, were sold to home hobbyists who could create their own anomalous forms of yeast and bacteria in their kitchens. And it was revolutionary. And beyond that, fun. 
fun to tinker, fun to create. The pet and meat industries gave us rainbow-colored aquarium fish, seahorses that incorporated gold dust in their cells, rabbits that glow green under a black light, the beefed-up super cow, the micro pig, the dog cat, and all the rest. The Chinese were the first to renounce any sort of regulatory control and upgrade the human genome. And if, as if they weren't brilliant enough already, they became still more brilliant as the first edited children began to appear. And of course, we had to keep up. In a room at GenLab, Connie and I were presented with an exhaustive menu of just how our chromosomes could be made to match up. We chose to have a daughter. We selected emerald eyes for her, not iridescent, not freakishly bright, but enhanced for color so that she could grow up wearing mint, olive, kelly green, and let her eyes talk for her. We chose height, too, as just about everybody did, and musical ability. We both love music. Intellect, of course, and, and, and finer features, too, like a subtly cleft chin and breasts that would be optimal, not too big, but not as small as Connie's, either. It was a menu, and we placed an order. The tall girl is right beside us now, smiling like the heroine of a Norse saga, her eyes sweeping over us like searchlights. She looks to Allison, takes in her condition. Boy or girl, she asks. The softest smile plays over Allison's lips. She ducks her head, shrugs. The girl, the genius, looks confused for a moment. But, but, she stammers, how can that be? You mean, you don't mean you... But before Allison can answer, a crow parrot sweeps out of the nearest tree, winging low to screech, fuck you, in our faces. And the smallest miracle occurs. Tiger, as casual in his own skin as anything there is or ever was, erupts from the ground in a rocketing whirl of fur to catch the thing in its jaws. As quick as that, it's over. And the feathers, the prettiest feathers you'll ever see, lift and dance and float away on the breeze. Thank you. Thank you. That was the premiere of that story. You can read it in the New Yorker next week, November 7th issue. Um, let, yeah, let's bring up the lights. Uh, we have some time left. I'd be happy to take some questions and comments. <laughs> What a world we're entering, folks. Uh, this one does have a question. Uh, this one's one of mine. We are discussing Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Uh, and the question is, The first question I'll ask myself, where do you get these ideas? Well, uh, <laughs> one reason I, th looking back on my career, I may have just delivered the 27th book, of, of which this is part. Um, it's because I'm not confined to any kind of story. The, the last story you, you've seen in The New Yorker like in May was The Fugitive, which is straightforward realism, but it's also about a scientific problem that we're having, that is the question of multiple drug-resistant tuberculosis in the community. And so, like everybody else, you know, I'm reading the newspaper and I'm upset about the world and I can't help worrying about it. And all of these radical transformations of our lives in terms of technology and now, of course, biology. And so I just come up with what-if scenarios, as in the Terranauts and the story that you've just premiered. It's the first time I've read it. Uh, questions? This mic is live. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, when you have, get the germ for a, an idea for a story, um, do you know what form that story is going to take? Like if it'll be a short story or the, the seed of a novel? And where yes, do, I do. do you... I don't know why or how this works, but I very consciously set out to write a story or a novel. Obviously this material, there's a lot of material here um, that could be investigated at greater length. Um, I don't know exactly how that is, but when it's time to write a novel, as it is now, I realize it's going to be a longer project and I take notes and examine things, or as in the Terranauts, for instance, uh, I read the books of the Biospherians, I read all the material that the press had released about them and so on, and then I went there, as I told you earlier, and, and looked at the Biosphere itself, and then in the process of taking notes, I find 
this as, as when we've all written term papers. It's the same process. You collect material, you don't know why or what it will be. But finally, when it's time to write it, if you're lucky, <laughs> it starts to happen. So uh, I only write stories in their period. I, I wrote these seven new stories this year to go with the five I had written prior to the Terranauts, and that is the Relive Box for next year. And now I'm hoping to, uh, sometime after the new year, begin the writing of the next novel. Oh, yes. I was curious if you feel like you have to like the people that you write about. Um, I don't take that into consideration. In fact, I, I think the most difficult thing to do is to create genuinely good characters uh, whom the audience will like. Um, an example is Plain Song by the late, late Kent Haruf. Um, he is able, with a sweetness of soul, to make characters you love, and, and, and with gentle humor, but also a little bit of the, uh, the truth about um, some of the darker aspects of, of humans. I've always felt uh, I would like to do that. I think I have created some characters who are, relatively speaking, um, uh, people you might like, like for instance, the, the characters in San Miguel. The, all three women in there, I think, uh, are, are quite likable. But really, you know, um, it's, it's the Yagos of the world who are more interesting, I think. And I also think, too, that, you know, in, in creating my fiction, I want to stand opposed to the, the sort of shorthand that we get in all our hero movies and so on. You know, the bad guys are exclusively bad and the good guys are exclusively good. And in my uh, experience of humankind, it doesn't necessarily work that way. I say it doesn't necessarily because, of course, I'm an exception. <laughs> Just ask my mom. <laughs> Could you comment on the um, false accusation that is made in the conviction of this Mexican in the uh, how do they come? It it, it um, puzzled me why, why he implicated someone in the crime that who was innocent. Oh, you're talking about the Costa Rica section when uh, uh, Sten. The first uh, part of this takes place in in Costa Rica, and uh, uh, there is an attack, and the protagonist who is an elderly man of 70, but a former uh, uh, Marine in Vietnam, uh, based on something I read in the paper, by the way, uh, grabs hold of one of these young men and can't stop himself and chokes him to death. So then he is detained by the Costa Rican authorities because even in self-defense, he's killed this man. And finally, after they grill him for a while, he's looking at the suspect who has been beaten up by the police. He's looking at him, he's right there. And the police say, is this the man? And at that point, he realizes that it's not. But he says, yeah, that's him. Why would he say such a thing? Um, God, it's not for me to interpret. I'm not supposed to be interpreting. Uh, um, I think it speaks to his character, uh, which speaks to American violence, which is the theme of this book. Uh, um, that at a certain point, there's no going back from that violent act that he committed, and he doesn't care at that moment. Doesn't care at all. He's just pissed off because of what's happened. Maybe that's it. But again, I have to leave that to you to decide for yourself. Actually, I have with me a 12,000-page thesis on all of my novels, and I'd like to read it to you tonight. Um, yeah. yes. Hello. I've read a couple of your novels, not all 26. By the way, I've read them all. I thought they were great. <laughs> well, I can't disagree with you. Uh, but I, I, I do work for an environmental organization that you spent some time with in one of your books. Nature Conservancy. Yes. And uh, I really enjoyed the book. And I'm wondering, I had read some of your earlier books. Did that influence you to take the turn that you seem to have taken at some point very much uh, toward nature and biology? 
or you, what's that always? You part don't of know it? what your themes are when you begin. They emerge, and I can look back on the books and see how they're alive. But don't forget, my very first book, a collection of stories, and this, these stories in this book, some of them are a return to this wild, surreal kind of thing. They're very much nature-oriented. The book is called Descent of Man, after Darwin. Uh, and I think uh, in 2000, I wrote A Friend of the Earth about uh, ecotage and global warming. So looking back on it, this is my obsession, my theme and obsession. And when I had the privilege of going out to uh, the islands off of Santa Barbara with Lotus Vermeer of the Nature Conservancy, I thought, wow, if I could just talk to a field biologist. But no, I got to go out with Rachel Wollstonecroft, the fox lady, and, uh, and tag the little foxes that are the size of house cats. Not your cats, which are fat and bloated and lying on the couch, but you know, a normal little cat. Uh, it was a thrill for me. So no, I, I don't think so. I think uh, these ecological themes have been ringing there all along. And, and even when I write a book like um, uh, The Inner Circle about Alfred Kinsey, who, who discovered sex, I think you may remember that, he said, the poets have had, you know, 2,500 years to talk about love. I will now tell you about the sexual function of the human animal. So that book is about nature too. W what is our nature? We are animals, but we also have this uh, uh, intellectual property and, and spiritual property. What does that mean? And you know, with, well, <laughs> I don't want to give a lecture, but in terms of uh, uh, what's going on with the environment and our overpopulation and, you know, the extinction of species, uh, the invasive species that are being introduced, what does it mean? Uh, not what, in, in ontological terms, what is being? What are we? So, obviously, um, uh, I'm obsessed with this, and I, I keep finding new uh, avenues to explore, as in the story you just heard, as in the Terranauts, which I've told you about at the opening. And I hope that that will continue. I, I can't imagine any greater theme that would interest me more. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, uh, should we be wrapping it up soon? A final question, perhaps? I'm just curious who you're reading um, and what authors you find interesting, what modern authors. Um, I read, I, I never read any uh, genre work. I've never read science fiction or, or uh, thrillers or vampire books or anything like that, be, simply because I, I really love the line-to-line -line writing of great writers. So some of my contemporary favorites, a lot of whom I know, but one, this, this person I've never met, Kajua Shiguro, you know, read The Remains of the Day and Never Let Me Go. I love his work, uh, uh, Dennis Johnson, uh, Louise Erdrich, uh, Dana Spiotta wrote uh, Stone Arabia, the greatest rock and roll novel ever written. Um, wow, Ketsia, I mean, there's just, there's just a, a, a host of wonderful writers out there. All of whom are my rivals, by the way, but you know, I can be big about it tonight. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. I'll be happy to sign your books for you. Thanks. Thank you.